but also just just wondering uh, i know you're interested in in issues of diversity in manufacturing so just wonder how do you see this playing out after the crisis is going to be more important in the agenda issue of diversity in manufacturing uh, or in what else can be done uh, to address these disparities there on the, on the diversity side, yes, it is absolutely passionate, um, passion of mine. Um, uh, the one that I, I just did a, um, a stakeholder engagement exercise a few months ago, um, and we were looking at some of the real um, entrenched inequalities within um, sectors in terms of represent, underrepresentation. Certainly, gender is the most obvious one, with 24% um, of female representation only within UK manufacturing. We've got to be able to do better. And the reason I think that really matters is that the point I made earlier about the, um, the enduring vacancies that we have within manufacturing sectors and within engineering, they're not going to be filled by more men, right? <laughs> we need more women to come in to fill these vacancies um, and, and to address the, the, the challenges um, that manufacturers are, are facing. The evidence is there. I mean, it's not just as in, um, take it, we know that companies that have more diversity uh, have better turnover, better profit, they're more innovative. So why wouldn't businesses take it on? I mean, that's easier said than done. Um, I, I recognize that. And we want to understand more insights into the barriers that are stopping more, more women in particular getting into to manufacturing. But I, I absolutely think that is a way that we can we can make manufacturing even better than it is. Thank you so much, Carol. That's, that's, that's great. And, it, and it's interesting that as you were talking about uh, skills and that you're Surely going to get a question. Skills, there's a question here, and I think it's very much related to to conversations around the image of manufacturing in the public image of manufacturing. So um, the question here is about uh, how can we make manufacturing more attractive to skilled graduates on a politically strategic level? Uh, what kind of, uh, it says the IMEC-E, for example, has released multiple papers and what it calls a crisis of graduate turnovers. Turnover rates, especially highlighting a gender disparity. I mean, obviously you talk gender disparity, but there is uh, the issue of more STEM skills, but also how do you translate those into more um, skills in, in the manufacturing sector? So yes, I think I'll put that question to you in terms of what can be done on a politically strategic level. I think that's a really tough one because I know my colleagues within um, DFE will point to all the really great work that's done to raise, you know, interest and awareness of STEM and the importance of getting more girls in particular interested in STEM um, and then to take up engineering. Um, I, I, but as you point out, that doesn't really translate into actual manufacturing people, you know, those girls, women going into manufacturing and engineering jobs. I mean, over the last 20 years, there's only been a 2% increase in female representation in, in manufacturing, despite all the pushes for increase in, in STEM and the interest. You know, I mean, I've said, I, I, I don't have the answers to this, right? I mean, you know, there, there is this view when we when doing lots of engagement um, with uh, stakeholders over this over the last few months, and we, we're asking, you know, what will attract? Is it going to be, you know, digitalization and, and a greater image in terms of technology? Um, is it going to be addressing climate change? I think these are to be tested, right? If they're going to attract more, more females in. I mean, you and I were discussing some time ago about the fact that, you know, what, what's the entry barriers for females into manufacturing? Do you have to have an engineering degree or do you have to have a technical background? Well, no, there are more jobs um, than, than just that. But actually, there is, um, there is difference between smaller firms. I mean, if you're, if you're going to access a, a, you know, a large company where you can you can get in, I don't know, I hate to use the HR when it's not that, but I mean, if I give an example, speaking to Kelly, Kelly Becker from Schneider Electric, who's the new VP, she's not an engineer by background, but she's, she's you know, she's come through the organisation to be a powerful woman in manufacturing and engineering. Do we need to look at getting just more people in from different backgrounds, um, you know, different, different educational backgrounds as well? As sort of just sort of focusing it on this is all about you've got to have an engineering or, or, or technical background. Um, so yeah, I, will campaigns work? Apparently not. You know, I mean, there there is research out there as well. DFE don't think that um, raising awareness and campaigns has a has a clear enough evidence base to do that. So I think you know just making sure that people are aware of the opportunities across the breadth of manufacturing um, and engineering does help. 
be it through careers guidance, but maybe things like digitalization and net zero will also help us. Good to get views on that. Yeah, I think actually, Jennifer, you've been, you've been looking at this issue of digitalization and how digitalization could be, uh, I mean, there, there could be the uh, barriers or perhaps lack of inclusivity in digitalization uh, as, as, as companies become more connected. I wonder whether you have um, any, any views on generally in the topic of inclusivity, what kind of measures can be, uh, have been put in place to address or to, to improve inclusivity in, in industry or in society uh, in general, but also whether you have come across anything as well on gender. Uh, no, um, it's it's very interesting to me that what you're mentioning, Claire, about inclusivity. And I was just wondering because obviously there have been like more and more voices talking about the need of, of a care reform in the UK. And if this is something that from an industrial strategy or from a manufacturing uh, perspective is something that the government is looking at because obviously it's uh, a lot of research and evidence on how care is still gendered uh, in general in the world, but also in the UK, and how a better care sector, both for children and, and the elderly, will allow more women to participate in the, in the UK market. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think, um, I, I... I wouldn't be so. I mean, I'd be. I'd be being. Uh, I wouldn't be being honest if I said yes. This was all joined up, and there was a plan to look at that. But you know, as part of trying to understand why we're not getting more, uh, you know, women and girls interested in manufacturing, we're looking at the barriers and obstacles. So if that is actually coming up as a strong barrier, you know, I think it's it's often raised as one of the reasons. I mean, you know, we talk to DWP colleagues about about this, and they'll say, well, "What about you know? What about childcare? Is that a barrier?" For example doesn't come out as the main strong strongest barrier although I think yes yeah and, and then again could could digitalization and technology and and the fact that we've proven throughout the, the pandemic that depending on the job there's opportunities to be more flexible right in the ways that we work is that going to overcome some of those obstacles I mean you know possibly uh, potentially I mean government is interested in it uh, and, and ministers are interested in the whole agenda I mean we as a sort of public body, have to publish um, equalities uh, goals, targets, if you like. So this is something that I've been working on um, with stakeholders over the last few months. We're hoping that something is going to be published fairly soon to set that out, particularly recognizing this issue in terms of, uh, of manufacturing. Um, so you know, if, that, if that's going to also help raise the profile, I think that's, that's, that's a positive thing. But I think one of the things that we're encountering, and I don't underestimate this, and there's colleagues I know on the call, including um, uh, Nina from, from Make UK, we've been talking about this. You know, there is an issue we've got to recognise that people find this uncomfortable to talk about. Um, you know, diversity and inclusion, I mean, then, then you know, we use them interchangeably, but then they're, they're not really the same. And actually, all the evidence there shows that you've got to have an inclusive organisation, be opening, welcoming, you know, to, to your employees, but you've also got to have greater diversity um, and representation for, for, to get the, you know, to maximise um, positive outcomes. But, you know, people don't like talking about diversity. That's my own experience within Bayes. It does make people feel very uncomfortable and clam up and lots of tumbleweed moments when you talk about it. But, you know, um, we, we need to recognise that it leads to better, it leads to better results. And the more that businesses recognise that too, the, the better, really.